have uh, Professor John Coffey from Columbia Law School to, um, to present his papers. Konnichiwa. Genki desu ka? I was going to give the rest of my talk in practical Japanese, but the organizers prevailed on me not to do it that way because it was too much of a burden for the translators. So I will speak in my halting English. But there's a problem with my halting English. After three sentences, the audience always falls totally asleep. I have learned to deal with that. I deal with that by giving you three bullet points up front, which cover 90% of my talk. And then you can fall asleep and snooze to the end. So understand what I'm going to say has the following three bullet points. One, uh, there is a hyperbolically accelerating trend now going on under which large corporations, I'm talking about S&P 500 index corporations, are no longer investing their earnings and their borrowing. In no, no longer investing their earnings and borrowings in long-term projects, including research and development, but instead are using both earnings and borrowings to fund shareholder payout particularly in the form of stock buybacks, put stock buybacks, and dividends. Where that will end, no one really knows, but it deserves a lot more focus. And it appears to be that the spearhead of this transition is hedge fund activism. Not the sole cause, not saying that, but the uh, leading catalyst has been the intervention of hedge fund activism in this rather dramatic transition. That's bullet point one. Bullet point two. There has been a major change in the players in corporate governance in the United States. It used to be for a long time that large, diversified institutional investors, and their names were well known to you. They were the pension funds like CalPERS, the mutual funds like uh, Vanguard, the asset managers like BlackRock. They were the really dominant players, and they were organized by ISS. They are no longer the critical players. Instead, we have the hedge funds, much smaller entities, but holding extremely concentrated portfolios. They may invest in six stocks, while CalPERS invests in 500 stocks. What's the difference? If your portfolio consists of only six stocks, you are very interested in firm-specific interventions, whereas if you have a portfolio of 500 stocks, firm-specific interventions is not going to affect your portfolio by more than 1%. So we have a very different focus for activism. That's the second bullet point. Now, if I have you still on the slumbering but not yet asleep, the third point is we really cannot measure the full impact of hedge fund activism until we can get data on two things that have not been adequately covered by the current studies. What are those two things? One, control groups. We need a control group matching the sample of hedge fund targets. There are lots of studies of hedge fund targets. But the question is, what happens to a control group of very similar firms? Does it perform better than the targeted firms or worse? If it performs better, it doesn't sound like hedge fund interventions help much because the control group did better. If it performs worse, it sounds like they did. There's only one study so far that's sort of done this, OK? Next, we need studies on the general deterrent impact on firms that are not targeted because they were dissimilar. These are the firms that were not underperforming the market. They were performing the market or better, but they are also affected because they are cutting back on long-term investment because they see the market having a new preoccupation with short-term results. We need that kind of data or we're still looking only at very simplistic studies of just the targets. Now, with that backdrop, let me now let you go off into slumberland, and I will start, uh, if I can find where the clicker is here. Now, if this is the clicker, this should magically move me. Okay. Now, this is my first point. We've got a revolution that may be in progress within the public corporation. Uh, probably has multiple causes, but hedge fund activism represents at least the spearhead the spearhead of this movement. <coughs> As a 2015 study of corporate investment by the Roosevelt Institute summarized, 
back in the 1960s, long, long ago, an additional dollar of earnings or borrowing, which is where companies get their money from, very few issue equity, uh, was associated with a 40% increase in investment. So you took this money and 40% of it went into long-term projects. Now it's down to 10%. That's a 75% decrease. And they calculate <coughs> based on this that from 2009 through 2013, uh, companies, large companies, uh, borrowed 900 billion but paid out 740 billion to shareholders in stock buybacks and dividends while investing only 400 billion. In effect, corporate borrowing today is primarily funding shareholder payout, not investment. Okay, now that's one study. The Wall Street Journal commissioned S&P Capital IQ to do a similar study, and they looked at the period between 2003 and 2013. <coughs> and they found that uh, looking at spending on dividends and buybacks, it went up to 38% of hot cash flow from 18% in 2003. That is, it doubled over 10 years. 2003 to 2013, the amount spent on paying back to shareholders doubled. At the same time, there was offsetting decreases uh, in investment in plants and equipment. Went from 29, to 29% from 33%. More importantly, look at who the targets of activism were. They were the outliers. They are the ones that put more of their money into a long-term investment. And they were forced to cut back to 29% from 42%. 42% was well above the average for other firms, uh, but they were forced to cut back to 29%. Uh, these same targeted firms both spending on dividends and buybacks to 37%. Now, <coughs> look at that this way. You take the firms that were targeted, and you take the year of engagement, and you look for the year before and the year after, you find that they're going in the year before engagement uh, to from 22% uh, of their funds were spent on dividends and buybacks to 37% the year after. That's a 15% increase just over one year. So activism is focusing on the outliers that were investing more than the average level, and it's affected them significantly. Okay, now, implications. One question for the future is whether the public corporation in the 21st century can still fund research and development or even retain its capital. If hedge fund activism is a principal force driving this transition from investment to payout, there may be an externality here even if stock, pr stock prices are enhanced over some short to medium term period. Now our time is short, so I won't go into all these implications, but I'll just stick with that one. Let's see if I can get us. Okay, now here is the special case of R&D. Uh, many economists, and they're, in particular I'm thinking of my friend Lucian Bebchuk, works on the assumption that corporate managers classically and instinctively over-invest in capital expenditures and research and development because they're seeking to manage, my, manage, maximize corporate size. In their view, hedge fund activism corrects and restores the corporation to an optimal investment policy. Now, personally, I think Lucian is a little out of date here. It certainly was true that corporate managers, once upon a time, did focus on maximizing corporate size more than profitability. Back in those days, they were paid in something called cash. They are no longer paid in cash. Corporate CEOs are paid in stock options, stock grants, and equity, and thus they focus on what a transaction will do to the corporation's stock price. That's their self-interest, and I'm not sure there is that same natural tendency towards overinvestment. But anyway, he has an, a rational argument. There could be an overinvestment, and we need to have an optimal policy. Well, what's an optimal policy? Let's look at what the data now shows. This is the Allaire and Dauphin report using FactSet database. FactSet covers all American mergers, acquisitions, hedge funds, et cetera. Uh, and they, they find that in the five-year period, this was 2009 to 2013, in the five-year period, the targets of hedge funds, the surviving target of hedge funds, that's a small class, those that survived the hedge fund engagement were not merged out of existence. They went from 17.34% down to 8.12%. Uh, 
okay? Whereas a control sample, that is, they reduce their uh, R&D expenses, expenses as a percentage of sales. They're using sales as the best measure. Uh, so R&D expenditures are going from 17 to 8, cutting about a half, uh, whereas the control sample goes up 1%. Uh, so there's something, the unique impact seems to be reduction in research and development. <coughs> having trouble with the machine, okay. That may understate because that's measuring only those firms that survived the five-year engagement. <coughs> Many other firms did not survive because they were merged out, taken over, and they are not in the sample. So we don't know the impact there. Okay, uh, now this, this is where the debate gets quite, quite contested and debatable. Uh, there's an interesting study by Brav, Jiang, Ma, and Tian, well-respected financial economists, and they say, Looking at a sample, they find that the targets of hedge fund activism, although they reduce their investments in research and development, do make more profitable investments after the hedge fund engagement. They look at the number of patent applications, and they say that the patent applications are more are filed by a targeted firm than by a matched sample. And that's a possible argument. Uh, it's a little contested because focusing on patent applications has a huge methodological debate behind it, how much you can learn from that, and it's a small sample. I would argue this, regardless of whether the hedge fund investments or the R&D investments made by targeted firms become more profitable, we should still be concerned about the total R&D expenditures because R&D produces positive externalities. For example, if, I, if my firm invents penicillin, it doesn't just create value for my firm. It creates value for the entire pharmaceutical industry because we have shown there's a whole new class of products called antibiotics. And society, the firm, the industry will all benefit. The firm that does the invention can't capture all the benefits of the invention. Therefore, if we reduce the total amount of R&D, even if we make it somewhat more profitable, we may re be reducing social wealth because R&D produces value for everyone. All right. There are further debates we don't have time to go into. Uh, how is R&D best conducted? Some kinds of R&D are best conducted in very small firms. The problem here is those very small firms have to be taken over by bigger firms. And if you can't invest in long-term investment, you have a problem. The hedge fund activists are discouraging acquisitions by the acquirer. They are pushing firms to be acquired, but they are, tend to be discouraging acquisitions by the firms they're engaged with. Now. Okay, now here uh, is the conference board study, and it shows this tremendous falling off that starts in 2007. That could be the financial crisis. It also could be in part the fact that hedge fund engagements really come into existence in their modern form about 2005. That's when there suddenly was a wave of hedge fund engagement. And here, uh, one of the problems in getting your PowerPoint slides in on time which is always a mistake, is the next interesting study comes out the day after you turned your slides in. You all know that problem. So here is the next interesting study. The people who do the S&P indexes have just come out with a study. And they have found that in the period ended March 31, 2016, the study came out June 16th. I sent this all in June 15th. I should never do things on time. I never will again. This, this is taught. Uh, they find that uh, for the 12 months ended March 31, 2016, S&P companies, not little companies, S&P companies uh, increased their total payout to shareholder buybacks to an all-time record level. It went up to 589 billion. Okay, 589 billion. What was interesting is. This was the same year, the same 12 months, that S&P company earnings went significantly down. Earnings at S&P companies over the same period went down to 856 billion from 989 million. Historically, buybacks went up when earnings went up because you had excess cash flow that you used to buy back. Now it's going down, but the buyouts are still going up. And we're getting to the point where buyouts, at least on that one year basis, look something like 85% of the total amount of earnings of those S&P companies. Well, I hope I didn't hurt anything by spilling the water. 
Uh, now let's move what we can. Are there other social costs? Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it's not my principal focus, but if we look at employment, here's another study, and it shows a relatively modest decrease in the total, if I can work this, well, this is the uh, overall employment level, and it goes slightly down. But if you go again to a control group, you find that a control group of similar companies would have been employing a much greater number. So looking at to, con to a control group of firms similar to the target firms, we find that there is a great fall off in what would have been the level of employment at the uh, firms that uh, are in the control group to the targeted firms. Um, maybe that translates into less people are being employed, or at least that's an implication. There's clear evidence about bondholders, and there's a lot of data that bondholders are systemically prejudiced uh, by this. Of course they are. If you increase leverage and their existing debt is going to be prejudiced, but it means that bondholders are significantly disaffected. Okay. Whoops, let me go back. I just want to put a little bit of historical background. Uh, all of this began around 2005. Certainly there were precursors, there always are precursors. People like Carl Icahn did this for 25 years. But this began around 2005. We've seen a record level of activist campaigns. Uh, and in 2014, activists gained board seats at a record 107 companies, winning contests in 73% of the contested cases. Uh, the scale continues to increase, and Dow and DuPont were both forced into a merger by activists on both sides of that particular aisle. Okay, now for the future, it's a little harder to predict because hedge funds had a bad year. For reasons independent of what they're doing with these engaged firms, they all herded into one large investment in Valiant and lost their shirt when Valiant fell by about two-thirds over a six-month period. Uh, okay, they're not going away, and they're basic impact is still to focus on cutting back on long-term investment. Okay, well, what will happen? What explains the rise of hedge fund activism? Well, you can talk about deregulation. The costs of proxy contests are way down. You can talk about structural changes, the decline in staggered boards, the increased influence of proxy advisors like ISS, proxy access, et cetera. I think the key thing that happened was hedge funds finally recognized they really weren't good, or as good as they thought they could be, at their original game. Their original game was to be seeking the best alphas through better research, to be the best stock pickers. And eventually they learned that in an efficient market, you can't always beat the efficient market. So some of them decided to abandon looking for the best firms out there, and instead find those underperforming firms that through surgery could be most easily turned around or split up in order to realize negative synergy negative synergy, meaning breaking up the firm so that the sum of the parts was greater than the single price company whole. All right, once they began to do that, they got extraordinarily high returns. They also discovered, probably without knowing this when they first did it, that on the filing of a 13D, on the United States, once you cross 5%, you have to 10 days later file this document called the 13D and disclose what your intents are. You file that document, and there is a statistically certain 6 to 7 percent abnormal gain on that day. That's a 6 to 7 percent gain that is fun to realize. Moreover, if you tip your friends and allies that you're going to file next Wednesday, and today is Friday, they might decide to invest with you, and they share in that 6 to 7 percent gain, and that creates a tactic that I will call the wolf pack. You're able to put together not a seven or eight percent group, but a much larger 25 percent group. Bottom line, costs are down, profits are up, gain in some areas is relatively riskless, that first day gain on the 13D. Uh, and so, as a result, there's so much money that we now see the American hedge funds going globally, seeking to define global targets around the world. And they've been active in South Korea, for example. All right, the success rate in proxy fights, very high, so high, that proxy fights seldom occur. They're almost always negotiated in the shadow of the likely odds that the activists will win. So the process goes quickly to one in which you negotiate how many seats on the board you're going to get. Okay, uh, what happens? If you get even one seat on the board, 
there's a 44% chance in one study, a 60% chance in another study, that the CEO will be gone in 12 to 18 months. Uh, okay, now what most explains in the new tactics the success of hedge funds? I think it's something called the Wolf Pack, which showed you that original Wolf at the Door uh, picture. The Wolf Pack is a loose association of hedge funds and some other institutions that carefully avoid being a group acting as a partnership for purposes of the American Williams Act, but as a common goal and advanced knowledge of the filing of the 13D. Those forming the Wolf Pack can tip prospective allies because there's no fiduciary breach and this is not insider trading under U.S. insider trading law. Thus, if you can exploit material, not public information, uh, norms of reciprocity are going to develop. You tip me, I tip you, we all get this 6 to 7% gain. It means you don't have to be quite that careful, quite that discerning in whether or not to conduct this contest because that 6 to 7% gain is going to be out there. All right. All right. Now, here's where I need to make sure we understand. This is meant to show you the impact of the wolf pack. The vertical lines are the level of trading. As I told you, there's this 10-day window. You file the 13 d 10 days after you cross the 5% level. When is this? On this diagram, my little pointer isn't working, this is, the, this is when you cross 5%, T minus 10. And the 13 d filing is here. Now look what's happened. All of this trading at 300% the prior level, three times the prior level of trading, is occurring during this 10-day window. <coughs> Now, there was always a long debate about this. One side said, well, that's just the insurgent increasing its share. It goes slowly and quietly, and then it buys large in the last 10 days. That's not true. That was the old conventional wisdom. It is not true. What we're finding out now, let me move on to this next slide. Uh, well, the wolf pack acquires a much larger stake, 13%, and it gets a much larger response. If they can recognize that it's a wolf pack, the market gives it a higher bang on that 13B filing. Okay, now, I don't know why this doesn't like to work. Maybe I have to point it at this. If I can hit this thing over here. Will this lisp over? I have a problem. Can someone? I'm going to hit him there. My apologies. Now we seem to have something going on. Okay. Now, did we go? Did we go back, or we go two ahead? Okay. Let's, let's do it this way. All right. Now let's go. All right. Uh, this is not what I want to concentrate on, but I want to get over this quickly. Uh, I think the U.S. is different than other countries because the U.S. does block acquisitions, hostile acquisitions with the poison pill. Uh, this is a substitute. This is probably developed as a way to get around the poison pill. And we see companies using this technique to force on a much longer, slower process the target into, a, into an acquisition, a negotiated acquisition. That, however, happens rarely compared to the three or four times the number of cases uh, that uh, are simply a long, drawn-out discussion between the hedge funds and the company. Uh, so there is this greater interest in realizing negative, in, 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 negative synergy by breaking the company up, but that only accounts for a small percentage of the total number of hedge fund engagements. Now, here are what I want to close with. Three important papers. The first one is by Marco Beck. I want to return Marco's favor by citing him <laughs> favorably. Uh, There's reciprocity in everything, you know. Uh, they find in a worldwide study that hedge fund activism results in long-term gains, but those gains are dependent upon the realization of an outcome, either a takeover or a restructuring. If there isn't that, nothing much happens. It's all noise, and you tend to sink back to the original price. Uh, gains associated with liquidity events or special dividends are fairly insignificant. Uh, corporate governance changes are basically worthless. 
I again see this as showing that hedge fund activism is paralleling the bust up takeovers of the late 1980s, which were eventually blocked by state law and by the poison pill. Okay. Now, next study. This is frustrating. One of these pulled me. Okay, I'll keep going one more time. That'll get it. Just hit it one more time. Hit it again. Okay, we're, we're getting there. Uh, technology. Uh, love it or leave it. Uh, the Bebchuk study finds that targets are very much like their industry counterparts, but were undervalued before. And they follow for five years. And what they follow is a modest conclusion. They follow, they find that the five year, they find that the uh, bounce after the 13 D is filed does not dissipate over five years. It does not get bigger, it does not get smaller. The five year, that, that, that noisy bounce on the 13 D does not dissipate. So it's not clearly, uh, uh, now this is going backwards. That wasn't supposed to be done. I'm almost at the end. We go kid it. That's okay. What I wanted to point to, one thing about the Bebchuk study is they tend to show that a very large percentage of all of these interventions are what they call investment limiting <coughs> interventions. They use this extremely severe criterion. Uh, they say if you are put into the top 5% of leverage, the bottom 5% of investment in long-term projects, or the top 5% of, of mergers, uh, if, you're, if you really are the investment limiting intervention because we're going to buy back the stock, we're going to increase leverage, or we're going to cut back on all long-term projects. That accounts for something like 20% of all these acquisitions. If they open the frame on that, moved it from bottom five, top five, to say bottom 10, top 10, I think they would more than double this and we'd find that maybe 40% of all of these acquisitions are investment limiting interventions, which is, again, a translation into the number one impact of hedge fund activism has been to focus on those firms that are investing more than the norm, more than average, in long-term investment projects. Okay, now here's the last study, the Kremer is jammed by my own SEP study. They take the Bebchuk data, they re-examine it, they don't dispute the conclusions. Uh, they point out, however, that the vast majority of targets in all these studies, including the Bebchuk study, have underperformed the market. That in turn raises the question of whether the subsequent improvement post-intervention simply reflects a reversion to the mean. Uh, to test for this, they do construct, as Betchuk did not, a match control group of similar underperforming companies that were not the subject of a hedge fund engagement, and they examine their subsequent performance over the same period. What did they find? They find that the value of the firms in our control group increase more than the value of the firms in the target group. They conclude in the years and following, in the years following intervention of activist hedge funds, the firm value of hedge fund targets deteriorates sizably compared to control group firms. So from this perspective, there is a reversion of the mean, which the intervention of the hedge fund seems to actually impede or slow down. Uh, thus we have the debate summarized this way. One size says targets improve, because of hedge fund intervention, and the other side says the targets improved slightly in spite of them, but they would improve much more if the hedge fund had stayed away. Uh, this debate will continue, but I don't think you can draw any bottom line conclusions so you figure out what's really happening to those control room firms. Now, conclusions, I think I have conclusions. All I, I want to skip the policy options, just give you conclusions that I didn't mean to go, go this long. Shareholder activism, I can see, is generally desirable but not always. Sometimes if you can find a riskless technique that doesn't make you have to do anything and other than announce an investment limiting intervention, uh, you will get a, uh, a significant gain on the following of 13D. The typical hedge fund invests for an average period of one year. One year from the day of the following is 13D. It makes a very large return. If it can do that, it gets just that seven or eight percent gain on that investment. Uh, it's possible, though, 
that we are encouraging an excessive number of interventions by making this technique uh, riskless. And by doing that, we can exacerbate externalities, namely employees, creditors, and the economy that may suffer when long-term investment is broadly discouraged. Now, although targets of activism are underperforming firms, I can see that it remains very under-resolved, very unresolved, whether activism is actually improving or impeding their recovery. Uh, still worse, we don't have an accurate sense of the impact of hedge fund activism on firms that are not targeted. For those other firms, they don't know they're not going to be targeted. They also will respond to the threat of hedge fund intervention when you make long-term investments. And so that has reduced the investment in R&D and other long-term investments. And you're seeing that still accelerating. The March 31 data coming out in June is very important data because it's an all-time record and against the backdrop of significantly decreased earnings. Uh, the deferred turn effect on third parties is hard to measure, but it shows up in this general shift from investment to payout. Bottom line, corporate, corporate governance affects not only shareholders, but society and the economy generally. And when we let the rules be exploited, there may be a need for rules that make you take a little bit more risk when you decide to intervene as an activist. Because if you do not, we are going to be discouraging all long-term investment. Again, <coughs> this is something that's in progress, still accelerating. And I just think that this has been almost ignored by the financial <coughs> academy. Uh, but the data is fairly strong on what the impact is. Okay, thank you.